your okay. your opinion. I'm of what I think of the army. Well, no, that's no. what you think of the army, okay? But don't hold anything back. You know? <laughs> and, and you know, feel comfortable with whatever detail we, we're looking for 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 your experience well, and your opinion. And you know, you don't have to. Because when I was in the Blame army, the whole army when I was in the army, I was happy, go lucky, and I didn't give a damn for nothing. <laughs> See, because I figured, well, they they can't court martial you, because I was threatened to be court martial at Vosnack there. See. Okay, wait a second. Well, okay. <laughs> you're not rolling yet. Are I'm rolling. You? Oh, you are rolling. Okay. Oh. Should we get the, the spelling? I will. I will. I will. Let's okay. Let's start the official way here. I need you to give me your name and spell your name. Because okay. it's going to be transcribed and we need to have that. Oh, yeah. You want my right name? My right name is Alexander, but everybody just calls me Sparky. And my last name is Kissy, K I S S E. S E. And could you tell me what your, um, what unit you were with and what your rank was yeah. and so forth? I was a first class private PFC with the 112th Regiment of the 28th Division, Company F. And I was a replacement. I joined uh, Company F in uh, September, somewhere in France. I don't know where it was. I was a replacement, and I was in northern France, Luxembourg, Belgium, and Germany. September 1944? 44, yeah. Uh, like I say, a lot of times we fought, and I don't know where... The, uh, the names of the towns or anything, all I know when we went through, they were nothing but piles of stones, so there were no houses. So we had no idea where we were. We just went where they sent us and followed them. Did you march through Paris? Um, no, I joined them after the parade. I was in Paris, but that was uh, before the parade, Then I was a replacement after the parade. So... I didn't get into any of that. So when you were a replacement, you were dumped into the Hurricane Forest, or you were dumped Oh, into no, before that. It was uh, somewhere in northern France. I don't know where. And then we, from there, we went to Luxembourg. And we were in Clairvaux and uh, Wilts and a couple other towns I don't remember. And then we went to Germany. And uh, let me see... Uh, Oh, yeah, before we went to Vosnack, we was in a town called Germiter. And uh, from there, that's when we went to uh, Vosnack in the Hurchin Forest. And we were in the Hurchin Forest. We got there in, uh, I think it was 1st or 2nd of November. And we were there for, I think, 11 days. And we got beat up so bad that they had to take us out because we lost the whole company there. There was, I think out of the whole company, there was only six of us left. But uh, I can remember when we were there. Let me see. My buddy got killed on November 6th. And he died, he got hit on the 6th. And I think he died on the 7th. And the way he got hit... We were right on the front line there in Hertz and Forest, and they brought some replacements up. And these kids didn't even know where they were, because they were trying to put a tent up in the dark. And my buddy and I are digging a foxhole. And I says, I better get the hell over there and see what those kids are doing, because all they kept saying, do it this way, do it that way. No, you got it wrong. Turn it around. So I went over there and I said to him, what are you guys doing? They said, well, we're trying to put up a tent. And I said, well, what do you want with a tent? They said, well, what if it rains? So I asked them, do you know where you are? And they said, no. I said, well, just look straight across the valley there between you and that dark horizon and the sky, blue sky, is a whole German army. And they said, oh. You mean we're on the front lines? I said, yeah, you'll find out soon the artillery starts coming in. So I went back with my buddy, and right before it got daylight, I said to my buddy, I said, kind of worried about them two kids. I said, they're going to go crazy when the shelling starts. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go over with that one kid in his foxhole, and I'll send the other kid over with you, and that way maybe they won't be afraid. 
So he says, okay. So I got in the hole with this other kid. And that day, well, that afternoon, I guess about 1 o'clock, of course, the old guys, we always sat in a foxhole and snoozed and let the new guys look around and see what's going on. <laughs> and damn old Germans dropped a mortar shell right on top of my buddy. And the kid in with him left out a scream and started yelling, and I says, how bad are you hit? He says, well, I'm hitting the legs. He says, but I don't know about this other guy. So I couldn't get to him till it was almost dark, and then right before dark, I went to pull him out of the foxhole. I didn't think he was going to make it, because we when not be like him gargling. So I finally got him to the aid station, and I didn't know what happened to him after that. But after that, I didn't want no more buddies. But while we were there, one day, at that time, I don't know whether he was a first lieutenant or whether he got promoted to captain. He sent three other guys and me. He took us way down about a half a mile in front of our lines. He said, I want you to stay down there and see what's going on. I said, well, what are we supposed to look for? He said, well, look and see what you can find. He said, Done it. no radio, no telephone, nothing. Me with three guys with a rifle and one guy with a BAR. So sat there, went down through this woods, and when he got to the other side of the woods, there was a field. And about 100 yards of this field was a big uh, lookout tower with a German with binoculars in it. And for the longest time, we couldn't figure out how the hell them Germans saw us. And we finally figured it out. We were smoking, and the guy with the binoculars saw the smoke. And they dropped three mortar cells in there. And the guy with the BAR got hit in the back, in the back of his shoulder. So these other guys got scared, and they said, what are we going to do? I said, well, I know what I'm going to do. As soon as it gets dark, we can get the hell out of here. So... Uh, <clears throat> Okay, right before it got dark, it was dusk, we took him back, took the guy to the aid station, and I went to report to the captain what happened. I said, well, we were down there, and they dropped these mortar shells on us, and one guy got hurt. He says, well, I want you to go back down there. I says, I'm not going back there. He says, well, I want you to go. I said, well, I'm not going. He said, well, I'm ordering you to go back. I said, I'm still not going. He said, well, if you don't go, I'll court-martial you. I said, fine. It's all right with me. I said, you don't get court-martialed here. I said, you get court-martialed way back at the lines. Well, he says, I want you to go back. I said, well, I'll go back on one condition. You go with me, I'll go. If you don't go, I won't go. He says, that's your final decision? I said, yeah. He said, okay, you go back in a foxhole over there. So that kind of that. So, next morning... I guess about 10 o'clock, there comes a German patrol. Right out past where we were, there was five guys and a medic. Of course, like they say, these medic had this big, like a carpenter's apron with a big red cross on it. They also had a flag with a red cross. Walked right in front of us, it was about 100 yards away. My buddy said, look at that. I said, what are you going to do? I said, well, just mow them down. I said, start from the back and go towards the front. That way, if, if you start from the front, they're liable to turn around and duck back into the woods where we can't see them. So we just started from the back, and we shot them all except the medic. We just left him go, and he kept waving his flag like crazy, running down through the woods away from us. So I guess they must have been dead, because three days later when we pulled out, they were still there. <laughs> so. But uh, that was one of the things. And... Uh, when you feel good, when they, when they start yelling out, uh, Camerad, Camerad, don't shoot us, don't shoot us, we kiff up, we kiff up, me Pollock, me Pollock. And I said to my buddy, I had damn no Germans in this army, they're all Polish. Because they thought if, if they said we, they were Polish, we wouldn't shoot them. Well, we didn't bother with them, it was just the, the stormtroopers that were, you know, if, some of them weren't bad, but if they were arrogant, why? You just see that SS on their shoulders and say, Who hunts us as SS? It's a, yeah, you know, real arrogance. Well, come on and take them back at the house and, you know, give them a goodbye and 
let them there. And they had kids. And this one battle, these two little kids, I guess it must have been about 12, 13 years old. They kept running up to me, was crying, the tears running down her face, and the bullets were zipping around. And I thought they were Boy Scouts because they had black shirts and black pants on. Dumb old me, I didn't know they were German Army. So I, I said, you kids better get out of here, you're going to get hurt. And I start motioning for going back towards our lines. And my buddy said to me, what are you doing? I said, well, these little kids are going to get hurt. He said, ain't no kids. He says, they're soldiers. He said, shoot them. The hell with them. I said, I ain't going to shoot no kids. So we send them back. So where they went, I don't know. But, uh, and, uh. Can, can you uh, locate me in time and place here? These stories that you're, that you're talking about. This was about in November. You were in, I know, but when it was when you were at Vosnack. Yeah, this was in Vosnack. In, in a, with your buddies in the foxhole. Oh, yeah. So that was who in, was your buddy that? His name was a kid named Kowalski. He lived in Michigan, Hamtramck, Polish kid. And a uh, nice kid, about 20 years old, I guess. And, of course, like when we were in the Hertz and Forest, of course, that was part of Wozniak, too. But uh, all these kids, all city kids, you know, you put them in three trees and they're lost. And uh, I used to keep trying to tell him, I said, you know, when we advance, look around, keep your wits about you, because uh, if you see like a barn leaning over or uh, a house all caved in, I said, look where it is. I said, because if them Germans start beating us back, you want to make sure you're running in the right direction. I said, don't run towards the Germans, run towards that house or that barn or wherever the landmark is. Well, they didn't know, see, that they'd always run towards us, because... You, uh, they figure we're more experienced. <laughs> but you don't have to be experienced. I mean, uh, like they say, the combat veteran. You know, I always say, if you can make it from here across the street and you're still living, you're a combat veteran. See? And Excellent. Hold that thought. To keep your wits about you. Yeah. See? Yeah. And, uh, Does a lot of what they learn come from another person? Oh, yeah. 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 See? We got, see, and I can't... Okay. Okay. Yeah, then now talk to her. Okay. Okay. okay, so 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 what made you so smart? When you, you how did you figure it out? Well, I guess I was the oldest guy in our company. I was twenty five years old, and they all looked at me like the father image. I guess I don't know, because I used to have to steal for them, steal food, and I had to know how to mooch stuff from the mess hall, you know, extra and stuff like that. They always looked to me, see, and. Uh, you keep trying to tell them to keep your wits about you and watch what you're doing. Because, uh, and you have to keep moving, see? And, uh, well, well, this was later when I got shot, but, uh, you see, uh. When, when you were brought in as a, re as a replacement. Yeah. You, you were green at that point. I mean, you yeah. Well, you see, hun, when you first go into combat, the first, fight you get into, you're so scared, you don't know whether to run, sit down and cry, or what. But once the fighting starts and you hear the bullets, it's fear just leaves you like that. It's, it's nothing. It, do, it doesn't bother you. And you can hear the bullets, and I know you when they're shooting at you, because when the bullets go over your head, you can hear them cracking when they go through the sound barrier, just pop. And when they go on the side of you, they hum. Just hum. That's they're missing you. See? <laughs> so you learn that one, two, three. But after the fear leaves you, it doesn't bother you. Because I can remember we were going through this one town. We were right in the middle of town. Then the artillery shells are falling and bullets are bouncing off the walls. And my buddy said to me, uh, Give me a cigarette. So I just reached in my pocket and handed him a cigarette, and we both lit a cigarette, and we're standing there right in the middle of the town. <laughs> and we're smoking. And uh, the bullets are bouncing off the wall, off these buildings. And my buddy finally said to me, you know, they're getting close. Maybe we ought to get the hell out of here. 
but it didn't bother, you know, it it seemed like it's, so what, I mean, it's noise, you know, and uh, I don't know why, maybe somebody else can uh, explain it to that, to, you know, why they weren't afraid, but see, that's why, like the day I got shot, well, you see, we had too many replacements, because we, we lost, like I said, a whole company, and when we got in this fight, we were going to blow up these pillboxes. They were German pillboxes. This was this was after the Hertz and Forest when they took us back. See, because we were so beat up, there was nobody left, and we got all these replacements. And you go through these battle tactics, which is like scrimmage on a football. You know, you do it in scrimmage, but at the game, it's altogether different. Where where were you when you got when, when I got shot? I were in Sevenig, Germany, on the Siegfried Line. That's right. Uh, outside of Belgium, on the uh, border of Belgium and Luxembourg in Germany. And uh, the day I got shot, who this captain was, I don't know, he looked at me and said, you're the demolition man. I said, I don't know nothing about demolition. He said, well, I'm going to teach you. So you can teach me. A 25 pound of TNT in a burlap sack. And he said, now nah, you put a, a cap and this TNT. And he said, first, before you put the cap in, you have to crimp it. And he says, there ain't nothing to that. He says, he just showed me how you crimp it. And he says, you put it in this TNT. He says, the only thing is, he says, if you don't crimp it right, he says, it's liable to blow your hand off. And I said, oh, Jesus, that, that's all I need. Demolition, 10 second lesson already. I said, okay, then what? Well, when you get up to these pillboxes, there was two of them. And the way they're made, a pill, well, well, it's a fort, actually, it's a fort. It's about eight foot thick concrete, and they have what they call a gun embrasure, and the gun embrasure is like a funnel shape, so they can swing the machine gun back and forth. Well, my job was to run up, slam this 25 pound of TNT in there, pull the fuse, and run. But he said to me, it's a five-second fuse. And I said to him, well, where in the hell can you go in five seconds? Well, he said, you'll find a place. And I said, holy Jesus, here's me, a walking bomb. So he says, after you set the TNT off, he says, you run around the back of the pillbox, and there's an iron door. He said, you open this iron door, and you go in there and get them Germans. I said, well, wait a minute. When I opened that door, I said, those guys are standing there in the dark, and I'm standing out here silhouetted in the sun in this doorway. I said, how the hell am I going to see them Germans in there? He handed me a flashlight. I looked at him, and I come right out, and I told him, I said, you son of a bitch, you're crazier than me. If you think I'm going to stand in that door in the sunshine and these guys are shooting at me, you got another thing coming, because I ain't going to do it. But what happened when we start running towards this pillbox, when the Germans start shooting, these guys all lay down on the ground, see, because they were never in combat and they, got, they were afraid. And, of course, there's nothing there. It's, you're right in the middle of a football field. There's no nothing to hide behind, not even a dandelion. So when you, you turn towards the pillbox, they have a steel door in there. Well, if you shoot in that gun embrasure, they shut this door so the bullets don't come in. So as long as the bullets keep bouncing off of this steel door, they keep it closed. So I shot at this one, and there was a kid laying there. A kid, well, a soldier. I said to him, now you keep shooting at that to keep it buttoned up. And I turned around to shoot at this one, figuring he'd keep this and closed up while I shot this and so they'll close this one up. And since he was too scared to shoot when they opened his door, there's poor old Sparky sitting there like a big ass duck. <laughs> and one shot and away I went. I got shot in the leg here and it flopped me on my back. So that ended my uh, bombing mission, which <laughs> I still like to know that captain's name, the son of a bitch. But then uh, the medic came, and he, uh, I knew him. He was, he was a friend of mine because I took him and went over the hill a couple of times with him. Because so, every time we used to go back for tactics, I always used to 
sneak away and go to town. I figure I'm not going through that battle tactics because it's for the birds. So when I got hit, he come running up to me and I says, how bad? Yeah, I said, ain't bad. You just got a little hole in your leg. And yeah, my foot was up under my arm here. So when it first went off, when a bullet went through my leg, it shattered the bone. And uh, first I thought I stepped on a landmine. And, I, and when I turned around, all I could see was this stump sticking up. And I thought, oh, geez, I blowed my leg off. Well, anyway, he put a bandage on it and he dragged me back. There was a little swale there, and he dropped me in this swale, and he went to the other guys. So when the guys captured these three pillboxes, they started leaving, and this one guy helped me back into the woods, I guess, about 50 yards, and he left me there. And I said, well, geez, you just can't leave me here. He said, well, I'll go and get more help. So he left me, and I'm laying there. And this happened by, by just about 9 o'clock in the morning. And it's cold, and it's rain, and in December, man, there I am in German territory. <laughs> what the hell am I going to do? So I try to cover myself with leaves to hide myself, because I didn't have a rifle. All I had was a hand grenade, and I had that in my hand. So I figure, well, if they come, maybe I can take a couple with me. So I'm laying there, and I'm getting colder by the minute. All I could do was smoke. So right before it got dark, here all the rest of the guys from my platoon came to get me. And because uh, when they went back, see, this was a hit and run job. When they went back, they all started inquiring, where is everybody? They get hurt. And the one guy said, well, he's back there in the woods. And they said, well, why the hell didn't you tell us when we were there? He said, well, I thought somebody else would pick him up. Well, anyway, they came back to get me. And it was, uh, well, it was about an hour before dark. So these four guys picked me up on the stretcher, and at that time I was over 200 pounds. <laughs> I was a big old hog. And uh, start walking, first thing you know, a guy got his foot tangled in the booby trap. So the sergeant, Sergeant Veliki, went over, untangled the wire off his foot so he wouldn't set the booby trap off. So they're carrying me. They went to lift me over a barbed wire fence. They dropped me out of the stretcher. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. So they picked me up, put me back in the stretcher. Gone through the woods, there's a little, little stream. <laughs> dropped me in the stream. <laughs> oh, boy, this is getting good. And uh, finally they get me out on a road. Well, a, well, a dirt road. They laid me down on a road, they were waiting for a jeep to come and take me. When they laid me down on the road, damn, it was a big rock and it went right under my leg where I got shot. <laughs> so when I yelled and they picked me up and moved me over and that's when I told them, I said, why did you shoot me and get the hell out of here? And they said, well, we can't do that, we're going to take you back. So a jeep came. They put me on a jeep and they took me to the aid station. Well, I got to the aid station and they uh, they put a splint on my leg, I remember that, because by that time my leg shrunk up about eight inches. See, when the muscles got cold, they just kept pulling. So I was laying there on a stretcher, and the old medic there, or the captain, they put a belt around my ankle, and I was laying on the stretcher. And this guy put his feet against the stretcher and started pulling my leg. <laughs> oh, man, I swear he must have pulled that thing three feet. And they straightened it out and put a what they call it was, it looked like a hairpin splint on it to hold it in place. So they left me lay there for a while, gave me a cup of coffee, and they said, you want to ride? I said, yeah, as long as we get the hell out of here. So they put me on a jeep, took me back a little bit further. They said, you want to go a little further? I said, yeah, let's go. And they finally took me to Rennes, Belgium. That's about, I guess it was a couple miles, I guess, from 70. When they got me in Rennes, Belgium, there was a little one-room schoolhouse there, and they had that made into a hospital. I guess it was like a mass hospital. I don't know what the hell they called it, World War II. And they put me in there, and I could see a, two rows of stretchers, about eight or nine stretchers in a row, and I knew it was in a school because there was blackboards all around, and there was a clock on the wall. I remember looking at the clock, and it said 10 o'clock at night. So they came, and they put 
gave me a shot of pentothal, and the doctor would start talking to me. I guess he was trying to get me to relax, but so I, he said, where are you from, Mac? I says, I'm from Pittsburgh. Oh, he says, I'm from Pittsburgh, too. He says, I was in a hospital in Pittsburgh. And I says, what hospital? He says, Mercy Hospital. I says, oh, yeah, I know where Mercy Hospital is. Then I got to thinking, why is this man lying like hell? Every city in the country got a Mercy Hospital. <laughs> but there was no use of worrying about that. But anyway, they gave me this pentothal. And when I woke up, I remember looking at the clock on the wall. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. And I had a cast on from my chin to my toes. So, well, that got me out of combat. That was a million-dollar one, boy. Because uh, we did have a couple of guys shot themselves. And uh, one guy, stupid, shot himself right in the instep. And we went running over there and took his shoe off. There was all these bones and stuff coming out of his shoe. And... We all laughed at him. We told him, so you're stupid, you're stupid. He didn't say anything, he was scared. I said, well, why the hell did you take a chance on the Germans shooting you? I said, you got a million dollar one, I don't know, I don't know if you'll get a Purple Heart or not. See, you might get a dishonorable discharge for what you did to yourself. I don't know, they took him to the first aid, so I don't know what happened to the kid. Can I, um, there was a wonderful story about through when you were wounded, but I would like to go back to the Hurricane Forest. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go back to let's go back to Bosnac because I know okay. you tell us, you know, describe some of what uh, what you experienced there. But let's, um, you know, when you got, you know, you your first cut experience was in was in France, and you got your, you know, you sort of got your feet wet. And yeah. Became, you know. One of the, one of the old guys who knew what yeah, you were doing, yeah. but when you went, when you, when you went into the Hurricane Forest, did you know, did you have a sense that you knew what to, what to expect? What did, did you know what you were getting into in the hurricane? Nobody knew, hun. Nobody knew what we were getting into. Even the officers themselves didn't know. See, this Hurricane Forest is so thick that if you go in there couple hundred yards, if you don't have a compass, man, you are lost. You ain't no Daniel Boone. You just lost. And the only thing we knew was everything with maybe a hundred yards, if that, of our foxhole. Outside of that, we knew nothing because it all looked the same. So we didn't know how close the Germans were. They could have been 50 yards away for all we knew, see, because the woods are so thick. See, and I mean, a guy could hide behind a tree and, you know, you, you can't see him, see? So could you um, walk us through a little bit um, when you went to Vosinac? What were you told about what your mission was there? They don't tell you. Just say, this is where we're going. You know, and they don't, they don't say why or anything. They say, our job is to take this town, see, and that, 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 that's all we know. We don't know the name of the town or anything. This is where we're going, you know. So, so everybody. Your company, your company uh, was told to go out on the. Uh, well, we went. Ridge to dig your foxholes in the front. After after we after we got on the other side of town, see. Well, in other words, Fosnac is not that big. I mean, maybe fifty houses at that time. I mean, fifty piles of rock. You might say, and. Uh, and usually over there, the churches are always in the middle of the town. So when you get to the church, you know you're pretty close to the middle of the town, which was about three blocks from where we were. So, uh, of course, you do a lot of shooting, and, you know, and, of course, the crowds come towards you, you know, the, the camarades. And all we ever learned in German was, Give it to hops and hans of the hoe, and we always thought that meant give up with your hands in the air. And where we learned that expression, I don't know, but they must have understood what it meant because the first thing they did was take off their iron pots. Because in the German army, that was a, a sign that we're done fighting. You know, we won't fight no more since they took the iron helmet off. At least that's what I was told. I don't know, but we still didn't trust them. You know, and of course when they 
when I give up, you uh, kind of searching for souvenirs. Well, if the first time we did, we didn't think nothing of it. But then one time one of our buddies uh, got a looter from one of these Germans. And uh, when we were getting beat back, somewhere he got captured. And when we beat these Germans back for the second time, here this kid was laying in the, in the middle of the street with the Luger in his mouth. They blew his head off. So from then on, every time a German surrendered, why, we used to search his pockets. And if he had a pack of Lucky Strikes or something like that, it was just goodbye Charlie. Because we were doing it for Smitty. This kid's his name Smitty. So after that, why, they better not have any American souvenirs on them, see, so. Oh, then one other time, where in the hell was it? So when you were going through, so you, so you fought your way through Vosnack, there were Germans in yeah. the town? Yeah. Uh -huh. you know about that a bit? And then, well, that's when we got beat up so bad, that's when they had, had a call at truce on the call trail, see. Because we had nobody left to fight. And there were so many wounded guys laying around both sides. So that's when they called a truce, and the Germans came from one side and the Americans from the other, see? And where were you when... We were up on, on a hill just about, oh, maybe a quarter of a mile or half a mile from them because they were down in the valley on a call trail. See, so what they did, the aid men gave aid to the first guy they came to, whether he's American or German, and if he's a German, he went one, and the American went the other, see? So, so you, were, you were up on... on we were up on top of the hill, see? We didn't know about the truce because that was down below us. So can you describe what you were doing where, up on the hill? Where, what's the, well, you we, didn't see, we, we didn't see any of the Germans where we were because they were down, like down over the hill into the valley. See, because that call trail is, I, I think it's just a hiking trail where the people used to go in the summer to take a walk through the woods because uh, it's not very big. It's only like some four or five, six foot wide here and there. And uh, it's just like gravel and stuff. Because I know, wow, we were going down the call trail there and there was a, the Germans put a teller mine in there and that's a mine for a tank and they're about two foot across. And his jeep was running up and down this trail, see, and I guess he was too light to set the mine off. And after about third or fourth time, I guess he kept bending that safety pin until at last he hit the pin. And the last we saw him, the jeep was about 20 feet up in the tree. They just picked it up, moved it over, and set it down on the tree just like a bird nest. And there it was sitting up there. So they had to cut the tree down to get the jeep down. Of course, in the way they cut the tree down, they just put a primer cord around it and set the primer cord off. See, and what a primer cord is, it's a, it looks like a clothesline. It's white. And if they... Uh, if they're going to blow something up, say they're going to blow five or six things up at once, well, they put TNT here, and they run a primer cord from here, and then primer cord to this, and the primer cord to the next one. And it burns so fast that when you set it down, you have to set it on a big loop, because if it burns fast, it'll just burn itself off, because the primer cord burns, uh, what is it, I think 40 feet a second. So if you've got four charges to set off, they'll all go off at once because it burns so fast. So that's the way they knock trees down. See, they just put a primer cord around it and put a, a little fuse on it, and when it explodes, it just blows the tree off. A tree that big around, and that thing is only like a little clothesline. It's powerful. <laughs> so, of course, that was the engineer's job. It wasn't ours. We were bad enough with a rifle and a BAR. See, I had a rifle, then I had a BAR when my BAR man got hit, then I took his rifle. And I carried that thing for about three days, and the damn thing wouldn't shoot because it was uh, carboned up. They were good gun as long as they worked, but when they didn't work, they weren't worth a damn. And I kept trying to get it unplugged and didn't get it unplugged, and it couldn't shoot, so I just threw it away and picked the rifle up from a guy that was laying there, and then I went back to being a rifle. <laughs> It doesn't pay any extra money, so <laughs> big deal, you know. I mean, PFC, 14 bucks a month, take home pay, boy, that's big money, you know. 
but uh, so can I put you back to that? <laughs> <laughs> you you would want that. Put you back to Vasada. Um, you you dug you had to go out and dig a foxhole, and were you you were in the foxhole for a couple of days up there? Oh yeah, and then a lot of a lot of times you would dig a fox, and they say, okay, guys, we're moving, and where would you move? Maybe fifty yards. Were you getting shot? At? Well, I don't know. They, battle tactics. We don't know battle tactics according to them, so we do what they tell us, you know. Okay, guys, we're going to move. So you move 50 yards and you dig another fox. I said, no, what in the hell? The other one's back there. Why do we have to move 50 yards? But that's the way they, that's the, the skirmish line or what the hell ever they call it, I don't know. They don't know themselves, you know. They, in fact, I think half the time you get to tell them what the hell's going on because they don't know, they, for, you know. You felt like the... Uh the higher-ups didn't know what you were dealing with? Yeah, you know, the animals are running the zoo. When you go, like, in the back of the lines where the generals are, say, oh, it's nice. Nice warm house, nice warm chow, and they're sitting there drinking scotch, you know, and the more scotches they drink, the better the battlefield looks, you know, and then you stand up to tell them what to do. And those guys are up there dying like flies, and according to their paper, we're doing all right, you know. That's why I'd like to be a general's aide, you know, I mean... When your uniform gets dirty, you get a new one, you don't wash it. So <laughs> that's why we were pool of mud sloggers. <laughs> what, uh, what do you think went wrong at Vasanak? What did they Everything. Do? Everything. Everything. And they had us spread out so thin that, geez, I guess we must have had one company trying to defend against the battalion. You know, because they couldn't see. And, you know, uh, from what I heard, a lot of natives used to tell them the Germans are building a hell of a big build-up over there, you know. No, you know, they said, well, those people don't know what they're talking about, you know. And so, and then they send you out on the patrol. Well, sure, you go out on the patrol, and them Germans ain't going to stand up and tell you where the hell they are. They're going to hide. So as long as you don't see them, you say, well, I didn't see anything. You know, I mean, so sure, you get down the road and these guys are all hiding in their foxholes and their camouflage and stuff like that. I didn't see a thing. So you get they figure, well, he didn't see anything. There's nothing there, see. But, of course, they got time. See, when you're fighting on your home ground, honey, it's a lot different. I'll fight in my backyard faster than I'll fight in yours, see. And that's the way they were, see. So, of course, they pump him up, too, with a lot of booze and stuff, you know, and those guys, you know, when they get half drunk, they figure, hell's fire. I can, I can get rid of the whole army by myself. From what I've read of what happened at Vasanak, it sounded like there was a, um, you know, there had been several days of very, very intense <laughs> fire, and, these guys, and you guys were pinned in your foxholes. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about that and finally... Well, when they start dropping these big artillery shells, hon, see, if you're in a foxhole out in the open, well, they send a lot of they call air bursts. See, and this artillery shell will explode when it's maybe 50 feet in the air. And then that shrapnel just comes down like rain. And, of course, that's when you wish the steel helmet was about four foot across so you could climb in it. But then you're, when you're in the woods or the forest, you jump up and you hug a tree. Because the shrapnel's coming straight down, this is all you got exposed. Where if you're laying flat, your whole body's exposed. But then when the shell goes off, then you can hear all this shrapnel going through the trees, ch -ch 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 -ch, cutting all the trees down like a lawnmower. See, and when you get back far enough where you can see, it just looks like somebody just came with a great big lawnmower and cut about 20 foot of them trees from 20 foot on up. There was nothing, just stump sticking out there. See. And if you're, you're in these foxholes at night, and pine trees, uh, the limbs always dry off, and they just keep breaking and falling off. Well, you're sitting in a foxhole in the dark, and all of a sudden one of these limbs will break off, and you'll hear it falling down through the trees, and you maybe that's somebody crashing through the woods, so you put a couple of bursts in there. <laughs> you don't know who it is, whether it's your guys or who, but whoever it is, Tough luck, you shouldn't be there, you know, and so. And then what do they do? From sun up to sundown, everybody has to be at wake, awake. 
from sundown to sunup, one guy has to be awake. So there's two guys in a foxhole. You stand there until you can't hold your eyes open any further, and then you kick your buddy, and he gets up. And you try to sneak in a little snooze. And then when he can't he open his eyes anymore, then he wakes you, so you just do that all night long until daylight, because they always used to fight at the crack of dawn. I don't know why, but soon as the sky would start turning blue. But you see the Americans, oh boy, we're, you know, we're sophisticated. Nine o'clock, you know, fight nine o'clock. Okay. <laughs> what I lost, Nick, was that after a couple of days of this really intense stuff, and you're not in the forest in a foxhole, you're out in the field in a foxhole. Right? Yeah, yeah. And finally there was just too much, guys couldn't take it anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you talk about that? Were you part of that? Well, when we went back, there weren't that many. <laughs> When they tool, took us out of Vosnack, there was, I think, about six guys out of our whole company was left. And out of the six, there's four of us that I know that made it. Two of them ended up being colonels. And the, the one guy was a second lieutenant. He went in the same time as I did. And the other guy was a first lieutenant, and they both stayed in, and they come out colonels. And I come out of PFC. In the army, that's as high as you can go and still have friends. <laughs> at least that's the way I looked at it. So. Did, did they take you out, or did you guys just say the hell with this? this oh no, no. They they says, "Come on, we're going to leave." So we, you know, we, we left. And of course, we, I mean, we didn't leave just like we were going to a picnic. We went on a dead run. <laughs> when they when they say retreat. To everybody, that means run like hell. <laughs> you know, it's not like you see in the movies. They're backing up and backing up. That that's for the birds. So you ran back into Vosnak where there was a yeah. camp post. Yeah, because I remember when we ran back to Vosnak, there was a church here in the middle of town, and all around this church was a little wall about eighteen inches high. It was like on a little terrace, and I remember when we were getting beat back. Man, I, I was so out of breath that my chest felt like it was on fire from breathing. So I remember going behind this church and laying down behind this wall to get out of the line of fire until I could get my breath. And after I got my breath, then we started going back further. And finally they they put us on a truck. I don't know how they took us. Uh... Okay, while you think about it. <laughs>